I think I read it. I My name is Tim, and I'd like to welcome all of you to the College of Complexes. As you can probably see, I've got a little bit of a summer cold I'm getting over with a hoarse voice. But anyway, the College of Complexes consists of the following format. First, we'll have a brief announcements period. Second, we will then have our speaker who will then speak for a an hour. Then we will have questions and answers. And then during that time, we ask that you ask a question. Because after that, we'll have our infamous rebuttal period where each of you can say his piece, either on or off topic. After that, we will let the speaker have the last word. The restaurant closes at 9. It's requested that we get out of here by 8.45. So on the announcements tonight, <clears throat> I would like to introduce with a rousy round of applause Germanel G. Van, author and political essayist who explains how the welfare state started in the United States and the reason why its policies harmed the people it intended to help. Let's welcome Germanel. Well, um, good evening everyone. It's an honor to be here. I was, of course, warned and informed of the ideological leaning of the crowd, so I think it's going to be a very interesting Q&A and rebuttals. I'm looking forward to it. So my name is Germinal Van, and I was born and raised in the Republic of Cote d'Ivoire, which is a small French-speaking country in West Africa. I moved to the United States about nine years ago. I pursued my undergraduate at the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C and I got my degree in political science, and I also got my master's degree at the George Washington University. And today I write about politics, specifically political philosophy, social theory, and political economy. <clears throat> so tonight I'm going to talk about the roots of the welfare state. I have an hour, but I will try to make it short and concise so we can enjoy our intellectual debate. So, um, the origins of the welfare state. So the, the welfare state was actually created on one fact and one fallacy. So the fact is that it was created out of the Great Depression. It was created in the 1930s. The fallacy is where it's getting interested. interesting, sorry, is that it was said to all of us and to the forthcoming generations that what created the Great Depression was a failure of the free market, a failure of capitalism, and a failure of free enterprise, which is actually not true. What created the Great Depression in the first place was a failure of monetary policy. And that monetary policy is called the Real Bills Doctrine, which was implemented by the Federal Reserve. It was an excess of uh, money supplied to commercial banks to attenuate the, the bank's panics. And that excess of money supply um, decreased, uh, decreased the inflation rate to 30%. And that uh, decrease stimulated the deflation. And that deflation generated the crash of 1929. So basically, it was government that started the Great Depression through a failure of monetary policy. So. Franklin Delano Roosevelt came as president in 1933 to provide a solution to this lengthy crisis. And the solution was to implement a fiscal policy that would be able to generate jobs for everyone. So as we know, it's Keynesian economics. And, but the thing that really happened about the government step in the economy and social affairs to um, to stabilize the economy was that it it was actually a boom, a boom for the government to expand its power beyond its constitutional prerogatives, because we have a constitution of limited government at first, 
and the Great Depression was um, an opportunity for those who love government expansion to actually expand the powers of the federal government because it was not written in the Constitution, as far as I know, that it was the role of the government to create a welfare state. But this is what happened. So once, so once FDR became president, the surest way to maintain government power in economic and social affairs was to implement social security and also to implement the minimum wage law. So these two policies itself ensure that the government can first of all withdraw money from the taxpayer paycheck every two weeks or every month when that taxpayer receives his paycheck. And the minimum wage, which was intended to help the low, the, uh, the low skilled worker, actually harmed him most. So basically, I can say that um, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, and that is the welfare state in America. It did not help those that it intended to help. So now I'm going to elaborate further on my stance. When we look at the um, when we look at the minimum wage, for instance, at first in 1938, it was implemented at the Fair at the Fair Labor Standard Act, and it was 25 cents an hour. So of course, 25 cents an hour it didn't affect much people because the rate of inflation was quite higher. So even anyone could get a job pretty easily. But then, in the 1960s and 1970s, that's when the minimum wage started to harm most, uh, most people, especially minorities, especially the, the, the black community. So what happened was that before the minimum wage law, anyone could get a job. Of course, it doesn't mean that someone has to do a career in that job he or she was exercising. Of course, someone who works at McDonald's flipping burgers in January doesn't mean that that person will be flipping burgers in December. So the, so the point of not having the minimum wage job was that someone to, can first of all wake up in the morning, be productive, and try to make some money for himself and to also help his family. So when the minimum wage was, was implemented, it forced basically the employer to discriminate against the low-skilled worker. So let's say, for instance, two individuals have, um, do not have the same degree. One has a college degree, one has an high school degree. But the fact that there is a minimum wage law, the employer will have to pick the one who has a college degree and discriminate against the guy who doesn't have a college degree. And that's how it went on and on. And every year, the government increased the minimum wage. It also increased unemployment. Because everyone could get hired. Also, one other thing with the welfare state is that the government used taxpayer money to actually create a lot of programs that kept poor, poor people poor. If I take, for instance, the black community, in the 1960s, the, black community, the poverty in the black community was at 22%. And in the late 1990s, it was at 73, especially when it comes to, when it was at 73, especially when it comes to children being born out of wedlock. And the total poverty rate in the black community was at 41%. So what happened was that, the liberal policies of the welfare state um, prevented women, for instance, to have babies. And it also prevented um, the black man, who is the authoritative figure of the family, to stay home and raise his kids. Because single black women were using um, the money that they received from the welfare state as, as a source of income. So it means that the man had to leave the house and basically sell drugs or doing other things that will unfortunately lead into prison. That's how the, the uh, black family unit got destroyed in the United States. And one other thing that the welfare state also did was that since those programs were created, it, it made 
the living wage even higher, higher in the U.S. and even um, more difficult for low-skilled workers to live upon. There is a fallacy that politicians keep saying is that when we increase the minimum wage, it also helps people attaining a um, living wage standard, which is actually not true. It's, it's not true because as the minimum wage increase, um, the living wage also increase. So the market value increases because the living wage is based on the market value. And we increase the minimum wage, so the prices of goods and services and the prices of rent, the prices of uh, tax property, everything increase. So of course, if you make the minimum wage at $15 per hour, per hour the prices of um, the, the price of the market value will also increase, and especially in big cities like in Los Angeles, Washington D.C., New York, etc. So it is important to understand that the minimum wage law, did, uh, not the minimum wage, the welfare state, sorry, did not really help the poor because those who were discriminated for not having the skills that they need to get into the labor force. They were forced to either stay on the street or go on the welfare state. So any individual that goes on the welfare state is a is a, a um, an advantage for the bureaucrats because the more participants they have on the welfare state, the more they can raise taxes to create new programs to keep those who cannot emancipate themselves economically in that state of perpetual poverty. So. I've always advocated for a gradual dis uh, dissolution of the welfare state. Of course, it would be unreasonable to completely dissolute the welfare state out of the get-go. So the, to me, the best way would be to decrease it by state level. So there's no federal welfare state, so each state has its own welfare. Because if each state has its own welfare, then we see that they will have to raise taxes all the time in order to keep their programs. And eventually, it's going to create a revolution in each state because people will be fed up to see their paycheck being deducted on programs that they don't necessarily need. Not all of them, but some of them. So in America, from what I learned, is that you have to work so from my language, but you have to work your ass off in order to emancipate yourself economically. I, I personally perform low-skill jobs after college. I work at restaurant. I work as a janitor. I clean. I clean toilets. I cook. I work as a uh, line cook as well. And it was hard. And I had a social security, so I was basically eligible to go on welfare, but I didn't. It's coming. Yeah. So I can understand for various economic reasons why people do want or need to go on welfare, but once they sign up for the welfare state, it's very hard to get out of it. Very hard. It is not impossible to work hard and emancipate yourself from the level of poverty. There are a few things someone has to do. Now someone needs to get at least a high school degree, make sure to not get a kid in his 20s, or if that person wants to get a kid in his 20s, at least he or she should be married before having a kid, and to not have a criminal record. That person who fulfilled these four or five principles will inevitably be in the middle class. So there are also decisions that affect people. It's not, poverty is not just something that is, it's not, it's not a curse. But the, the human race was born in poverty to start. So it's the, it's the assembling of skills, talent, and abilities that create wealth. So in order to create wealth, we need to let those who have the power to create wealth to do so, so they can employ those who do not have that power, that power in order to be elevated from the level of poverty. Ladies and gentlemen, this is my 
brief um, presentation about the welfare state. As I said, it wasn't very long, but it was pretty concise. And now I'm open for questions. Hey, Who wants to buy through uh, eating dinner that could get up and moderate? Can you put your mind? I can moderate. Just say go ahead. He'll help you. Pay. He'll you gotta be a person. Isn't it a fair? Yeah, before we actually. All right, be ready. This All right. Isn't it a fair that before we had a government welfare, that we did have what they called the dole, where they would give a pittance to uh, like people that were broke, and wasn't it also considered? like scandalous to have to uh, ask for help. So basically it's coming ass. It's all a um it's all a mentality. So before the Great Depression the United States was probably the most individualistic nation when it comes to self reliance, self help, you can do it on your own. And then when the welfare state was actually implemented, it kind of devalued that mentality, the mentality of individualism. It shows that people have now to rely on government. And the reason why the founding fathers created limited government, it was for us to not have to rely on it. So that, so basically the welfare state changed the philosophical um, mindset of the American political culture. Uh, this lady right over here. Yeah. The government, what you say is the government being this like this because there were people dependent on the government? Is that what you're saying? I didn't hear you. Is that what you're saying? That you want the government, the government created this because they want us people to depend on them? Yes. No, what I'm saying is that we want government, the federal government at least, to withdraw itself from the welfare state. So what I'm saying is that if the welfare state has to exist in the US, at least it should be by states. Because it will be too, uh, too radical or too brutal to just dissolve it completely because many people depend on it. And the reason why even politicians, Republicans did not get rid of the welfare state is because most voters are on welfare and they need those voters for order to stay in power. Mr. Gentleman. So, are you saying that Franklin Delano Roosevelt instituted the Social Security program and the a minimum wage program was a bad thing? His intention was not bad. <laughs> the outcome was harmful, especially for those that it intends to help. That's that's my point. It was harmful for those that it, it intends to help. I mean, with all the people unemployed and, and, and so they were supposed to stay unemployed and kind of dig themselves out by themselves? Like, I, I, I don't know. No, so what I'm saying is that the policy he implemented surely helped at the time, but it was a short, it was a short term gain because in the long run, it, it created more unemployment. At the time when he came, he raised everything up because the, the inflation rate was high too, so it benefited everyone. But those policies that he, he implemented in the 30s had his adversarial effects in the 50s and the 60s. Mr. Cohen. Um, what class do you come from in Africa? What class? Yeah. I come from a good family who went to school and they were able to afford private institutions for me. I come from the upper class and I'm proud of it. Okay. Uh, Karina. All right. Um, the family and the mom and the dad just decide they're, they're really lazy, they don't want to work. Should the children have to suffer or there's a woman, she's had a child, the father walked out on the kid. What, what, about, what about the children? How, how who's going to take care of the children, it, it's if, not the child. If none of the parents wants to work. I mean, we, we have social services in this country, which is something that in most countries there is none. <coughs> children suffer actually more in other countries where there is no social services, especially if the parents 
do not want to work for because they're being lazy. <coughs> I think it's important that then social services take care of these children and then they can maybe have have a parent who are more responsible to school them and make sure that they have a good in life. Well, that is exactly done, I'm sorry. So how how do we Okay, so how? I mean, okay, so for this, I, I have an answer for this. Yeah, sure. I think that we should just, we shouldn't hand out welfare checks like that. If we have people who need assistance, they should show up to some facility like a school and learn skills or learn education or learn child care, but they should spend their eight hours in just like normal working people doing, doing something constructive. It is, instead of sitting home watching television and okay. talking on their cell phones. And the problem is that we allow these people to remain stupid. And, and it ha this is what has to stop. Okay. So and what's then, the question? No, she said she had an answer. She had an answer. Yeah. Well, that, well, that's, that's my answer. All right. Well, we'll wait for rebuttals for uh, that sort of thing. Uh, George, you had a question? Yeah. Uh, do, 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 you, do you think Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats are letting in all these illegal aliens? to eventually get their vote and also to make jobs for the, their bureaucrats. They're making jobs for the bureaucrats too. Yeah, but so, they eventually want their vote. Yeah, no, I mean, of course. And the, the, and the thing is that those yeah. illegal aliens, they first of all want their votes, and those illegal aliens as well will be on welfare yeah. because they can't do anything. And those guys will be like, oh, the Democrats are the ones who led us in this country, so we owe, we owe them. Uh, our votes, and that's what happened also with the black community since the 1960s. Right. So, of course, like they, the black communities shift to the Democratic Party for economic reasons in the 1930s because of the policies of FDR, and then with the uh, policies of LBJs, it be, now they became committed to vote Democrats, although those policies do not help them to thrive. What do you think of Trump? He's trying to help, right? He's trying yeah, to help. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's definitely doing his best, he's for sure. Like, yeah. in, with a dereg deregulated economy, when you look at the numbers, we may hate the guy, but the numbers speak for themselves. He's, he's doing well. People, unemployment is low in most, in most communities, and that's a good thing. All right, Charlie. Charlie. Uh, According to your narrative, the capitalist economy was doing just fine, and the government caused the depression of 1929. Yes. However, since the country was established with the Constitution, since 1790, there have been 47 depressions or recessions in the United States. Is your assertion that all of these have been caused by the government and the capitalist system has been functioning, would be functioning properly in time were it not for the government? So, all 47. You say 47? Yeah. Yeah, but those 47, people don't really know much about it because government was so limited at the time. Well, then how can government cause a depression? Where the government it goes against your assertion. No, the government caused a depression because the Federal Reserve is a it's a branch of government. They're the ones that control or value or uh, determine the value of money. They were the ones that supplied those that money to commercial banks in order to pay their loans. Does, does the All right, Charlie. Uh, that's uh, three questions. Jonathan. Thank you for your talk. In my lifetime, we've given trillions of dollars of uh, money to the financial services industry, Wall Street yeah. CEOs, big surveillance, yeah. military industrial complex, prison industrial complex, fossil fuel industry, health insurance industry. I could go on on that list. Is that included in your definition of the welfare state? Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I'm a little curious. Is that why your talk was so brief? You say, is that why my talk was so brief? Correct. No, that, that, no, that was, you know, it wasn't why. Uh, maybe he was being, uh, corporate, maybe he didn't, maybe he's looking at the corporate welfare differently. Maybe that's why it wasn't included in the scope of the talk. 
Well, I think that's welfare. The it state is. It's policy. I think I think there's an omission there in the talk of at least addressing that for like four more seconds. <laughs> what what should we do about uh, corporate welfare? Yeah, welfare for billionaires. Yeah. Well, I mean. Here's the thing, like, we always accusing billionaires for exploiting the worker, that Marxist philosophy that has been implemented in the 19th century. Billionaires are the ones who have the power to give employment to those who don't have those means. So if, no, I mean, if you want to tax them as much as, 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 much as you want, how those who are in the state of poverty would get employed? Yeah, but should they still be able to get special favors from the government and free money, for, or not even free money, taxpayer money to... Uh... I mean, no, definitely not. On, on that part, no. Of course, we need plantation. Uh, Tim, do you have a question? <laughs> My question is this. One full at a time, please. I'll tell you what, I'm going to pass and ask it later. Okay. okay? Uh, you, sir, at, uh, you had a question? Yes. Uh, but uh, do these people uh, pass the course on the correct way to lean against the desk? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you repeat the, could you repeat the, the question people, again? Do they pass the course on the correct way to lean against the desk? Courts leaning up against the desk? Yeah. Meaning they don't do anything. It's an analogy. CEOs don't do anything is what he's asking. Andy, you had a question? Yeah. So basically, okay, you say that CEO that don't do anything. Does the CEO contribute anything to the I mean, first of all, actually, I, 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 uh, Andy's yeah. had the question. No, go ahead. I'll let you wait. Follow up with I mean, first of all, it's a, it's a fallacy to say that the CEO or the business owner don't do anything. First of all, they're the one who come with the idea of creating the business. Oh. I mean, they're the ones, like... <laughs> I mean, who else in your opinion? Who else? Who else come with the idea of creating a business? Yeah, they have the attributes. Yeah, I mean, like, the worker, okay, the worker goes to work from nine to five, and maybe he goes to his second job. Once he's done, he goes with family or, or goes to his second job, but the boss has to stay. He's the one that taking oh. all the risk. Uh, yeah, I mean, who else? He's the one taking all the risk. If, if his company fails, who's gonna take the blame? He's definitely not the worker. He's, 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 de he's definitely the, the business owner. He's the one losing the money. Okay. Uh, we got Andy. Uh, did, uh, did you uh, get a graduate degree in business or economics or anything in this country? No, I never. What I never your take degree it. in specifically? Your education. I, um, I got my degrees in political science. Political science. Yeah. I never took a single class of economics. The question I have for you: Did any of your political science teachers ever talk about the growing middle class in this country between 1945 and the end of the war and 1973? You're unfamiliar with that whole period of the growing middle class. Not that I'm necessarily unfamiliar, but I did not take a specific class on that, spe on exactly. that specific if, time. If you had studied that, it would be very uh, pertinent to your talk tonight. You'll, get, you'll hear about it in some of the rebuttals. All right, she had a question over here. I just wanted you to clarify something. When you say that the boss is the one... One time. When you say that the boss is the one that works late, are you... Are one you full at a time. Are you talking about a privately owned company or a corporation? Because no, no, privately owned company. Right, yes. because the corporations don't have that accountability. They don't. And there's a tremendous disparity of income between CEOs and middle management and just workers in general. And I don't see CEOs having any concern for the middle class, even though it's the middle class that preserves our democracy. Okay. But the middle class is currently shrinking now because they most are moving to to, um, to the upper class. They're even moving to the upper class or or the going to the lower class. But it, it is shrinking. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, why would you say there's such a high rate of 
welfare and poverty and the homelessness in California. It's really, really terrible, I think. Because it's comfortable sleeping over sleeping outside at night. <laughs> that one where I do not have an exact answer yet. The, the California case. Their, their policies, their policies, let all these migrants in. I mean, I, I mean, I know that uh, in California, for instance, yes, their policy is actually affecting those in the lower class because there are people who cannot even afford an apartment. And I know they recently increased the, the minimum wage in California. They even trying to pass also a bunch of welfare policies that um, that affects people to have access to those things. So. Uh, Behind George, I'm sorry. I think you said that because of something Teddy Roosevelt did, that from that from his time in the 30s, yeah. that the um, middle class shrank. No, it it, uh, it actually grew because many people were employed because of the policy okay. that he. Because I, I misunderstood you. Now, okay. It's reported in the Wall Street Journal that no matter what, how a business, be, if, if a business makes money or loses money, it doesn't matter, the CEO pay still goes up. Yeah. It's, it's immoral. It is. It is immoral. Why are Question CEOs, mark? Why, why are CEOs um, still uh, getting pay increases when uh, the why the money of the CEO of so CEO's corporation increases? Why people's money do not? No, when when a company okay, so a company pays, should the CEO still get raised? Why? Because the stockholders don't vote them out. That's right. Yeah, that's part of it, and also because the government has, because the the policies of the government actually enables corporations to have the monopoly of the market. So that is why, like big techs, for instance, or Walmart. Those CEOs, they don't go because they, the policy of the government helps them to stay, and they have lobbies in Washington that pressure politicians to pass laws that will help them. How about Boeing? Can you give an example, please? Boeing. So um, I can even take Amazon. I can even take Amazon for say Jeff Bezos. Like he can easily, he he decided to um, put one of his headquarters in Virginia. Because the reason why is because it could be close to um, to Capitol Hill in order to influence Republicans and Democrats to pass laws that will facilitate um, his domination in the market. And it's not just it's not just uh, just Jeff Bezos, but also Google, um, Facebook, and Walmart. Uh, Adam, do you have a question? Uh, Can you stand up? Yes. Um, I had two, I can do them in two rounds if other people need turns. Uh, but you had mentioned the, the orange master earlier, uh, Donald Trump, whom I loathe. And I think one of the things I found reprehensible about him is that he wants the welfare state to be there for his low income white voters and then gin them up against yeah, everyone else. I want you to clarify what you said when you thought he was doing the best he can. I mean, I thought that was <laughs> nonsensical. I mean, I understand. So. The numbers, as I said, the numbers speaks for themselves. Like, generally speaking, he's doing good. But as you say, like, when you look at the um, low-income white voter for some in West Virginia, in West Virginia, those ones, they're, they're on welfare state, but they still vote for Donald Trump. Yes, ma'am. What numbers are you talking about that he's doing so good? No, I'm talking so. Basically, the, the national GDP. <laughs> You know, that, but that's kind of a carryover from what happened maybe five years ago. What's happening right now is that everything is declining because there's a contraction because people can't get the components they need to build anything here. Trade is shut down. Prices are going up, and the ultimate person who's paying for all this are uh, the consumers. It's not these people that he's attacking out there in China and God only knows where else. It's us. I, I mean, how can you see that this is a benefit? No, no, I was saying, generally speaking, like the numbers right now. No, there's it's, numbers, it's bullshit. All right, can you answer the question, please? 
No, but the numbers right now, I understand your, your, your feeling, but the numbers right now, the GDP is 3.1. And, and when you have a national economy that has a GDP of between 2 and 3%, that, that economy is healthy. No, it's, it's not. It is. One full at a time. All right. So I, I wanted to clarify something yes. and uh, then ask a question. It, it seems to me that your position, is this correct? Your position is you want to get rid of all welfare, and but the transition is to do it at the federal level uh, first and pass it on to the states and then yes. eventually get rid of all yeah, welfare. Decentralize. Okay. So, so my question is um, why, why why do it that way? Why not start at the state level and just uh, just pilot all the responsibility on the federal level on the with the goal of eventually getting rid of because voters? because the federal because federal law overrides state law. So if there is no welfare state at the federal level, so now the states are more independent to implement it or not implement it depends on whatever state. Because if we, because the welfare state was not built from the state level first, it was built from the federal level, and then the federal level is uh, the federal government is the one that subsidizes those states that have those welfare programs as well. Uh, Tim, I'd like to know where you stand because about health insurance and coverage on that area because I know for a fact I've had at least three friends of mine who had catastrophic medical coverage you know they, they wound up bankrupt all three of them before they did anything else before the government kicked in two of them are now dead because they, they, they couldn't really cure their conditions but you know they were bankrupt before anything happened how you know I mean we're the only country left in the world that doesn't have some form of of, 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 of socialized medicine. What are your thoughts on that, please? So the problem with socialized medicine is that it has a moral compassion point. That's why most country, well, Western countries, more developed countries have it. With socialized medicine, once the government is the one that um, is the one that administer uh, medicine, it controls the means of production of that industry. And the government is naturally inclined to inclined to mismanage resources at some point. But then how come we're paying twice as much in the United States as we are as other countries are? For example, for, for the drugs. simple reason of the third party. Because us we don't at first like we don't want to have to spend directly from our own pocket for health insurance. So when we work for whatever employer, we have health insurance with that employer. But we don't get to make the arrangements that we would want with the private insurance is the employer that does that for us because we use their health care their health care plan and since the employer has the money to afford it since it's an entity so the price of health care rise but the lobbyists that's the problem the lobbyists is the problem yeah all right the lobbyists is the problem because they want us to be Healthcare to be expensive. Was that, that the healthcare lobbyist? There is no, you know what I'm saying? What's the question? She's blaming lobbies basically okay. as the ones to um, make the price of healthcare being expensive in the All right, I was just curious, thanks. No, no worries. Uh, uh, Steve. Stand, please, if you don't mind. Yeah, so I actually. I actually want to add to this, this discussion about health insurance because I actually work in it myself. Um, we can have discussions during the rebuttals, yeah, but this oh, is for okay. questions. Sure, yeah, my question. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yes, sir. Sure. Sure. Uh, we're, we're, if, uh, and who hasn't had a question yet uh, before we go on to second round of questions? It's more like the fourth or fifth yeah. round, but All that's right. okay. <laughs> yes, sir. If, if the governments, <laughs> governments by their nature, Results if government manage, management of health care by its nature results in higher costs, then why are all of the socialized medicines throughout the world cheaper than ours? The ones that are run by government. It is, it is cheaper the world. Because, because when you receive health, uh, medical attention, you don't get to pay there, but they take a lot from your paycheck. That's, that's because that's the way government subsidizes its program. They take a lot from. 
Governments around the world take a lot from citizens' paychecks to provide free education and many other things that we don't have here also. But the cost of medicine itself is cheaper everywhere else in the world. But does it mean it's, it's good by, quality? It's, man, it's run by market. governments. Yeah, but does it mean that it's good quality? Having access doesn't mean that you have the, the greatest quality you want. I mean, there is a I mean, there's a reason why it, things it's are also good expensive. Quality because their births, their life births are better than ours. Their life, their length of live, their life length of living is better than ours. Okay, and there are other measures that are all better than ours. We are not at the top. Yeah, we're not at the top, but their health programs is not at the top too. Because first of all, their health somebody program somebody has to be at the top. All right, no, uh, their health program. Let me answer the question. No, their health program is not even fully a single payer system. There's still private insurers that contribute to that. That's why it has. That's why it has lasted for so long. Yeah. All right, we'll go with Mr. Cohen and then George. All yeah, right. the, uh, actually, we say we have three, three and a half percent increase in productivity every year, whatever. But a lot of that is done through robotics. It does not put people to work. And people, they say three and a half percent, they don't count the people who stop looking for work. They don't count people that just came into the labor force. And that's about 45 or 50 percent that are not working in the United States. So it's false. <laughs> All right, now. <laughs> uh, always, we say we get George. Okay. Uh, w wasn't the black family in the United States strongest in the 1950s? What happened? How, how come it just fell apart? It was. <laughs> so, what you understand about the black family is that in the 1950s, they didn't have political rights, but economically, they were better off because of the black family unit. In the 60s, the, policy, the policies of LBJ destroyed the black family unit. And that's how the black family unit was, has become, at, uh, has been at the ladder of all communities in the US. We'll go with Dagny, then we'll go with uh, Charlie. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of on topic, but you know, when you start to use justice that the welfare system was started by Roosevelt, uh, one of the things that's kind of left out on this whole thing about Roosevelt was the fact that he was also subsidizing the corporations. In fact, they went over and were doing a lot okay. of things in Europe just to keep the corporations going, which did create jobs here. What's Nobody wants question? to talk about that. Um, question, question, please. And question, I please. Why did you mention the fact that uh, Jews won't buy Ford cars? They weren't? No. <laughs> oh. No. What? Okay. What was that? Why won't Jewish people buy Ford cars? <laughs> 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 you know, All right, don't answer that question. We'll go with Charlie. Fix or repair <laughs> daily. Terminal before 1929, there were virtually no government regulations of any significance or magnitude <coughs> on the capitalist economy. And you come along and you say that the government somehow is responsible for causing problems. The agencies didn't exist. They didn't even have employees. The government... Congress the, was... The government of the federal government was almost non-existent. Congress was the branch of government that actually created the Federal Reserve. And the Federal Reserve, as I said and I keep repeating, was the entity that implemented a bad monetary policy. And that monetary policy, unfortunately, led to the crash of the stock market. One follow-up question. There was no private investment activity of any magnitude that may have has precipitated the Great Depression? No, I, nothing going out like in Florida? I mean, there, there probably was, but it wasn't enough. Why did, one last follow-up, why <laughs> did it go from 1913 to 29 to take effect? Well, because, the last time? because after the war, so first of all, after uh, the First World War, the Federal Reserve started lending excess of money supply to commercial banks. 
and that excess of money supplied to commercial banks was unfortunately that policy that created the deflation so all the prices of the goods and services dropped and that led to the crash of the stock market because the 1920s was a, a an excessive economic expansion in the US because of that excess of money supply from the Federal Reserve so it busted when it ran out. Exactly. That's okay. sadly ridiculous. We'll go with Karina, then we'll go with uh, Andy. Okay, uh, Charles Dickens, he wrote um, the story, he wrote um, A Christmas Carol. In The Christmas Carol, during that time, people who were impoverished lived in workhouses. There was great poverty. How would we have resolved that poverty in the time of, let's say, Charles Dickens' uh, Christmas Carol? Let's make it the 18, uh, 40s. Yeah, 1840s. But what, it, what needs to be understood is that, is that <laughs> poverty is not a curse on its own. Like, no, it's not because the human race was, was created in poverty. Okay. What, what eliminates poverty is when people use the skills, talent, and ability into the market, when they participate in the market activities to, to create productivity, and that, and that productivity creates wealth. So that, that, that's how it is, not like poverty is something that God, it's not something that God, you know, punish people with you. All right. Quick, um, how much? All right, we'll go with, I'm sorry? No, no, I'm, I'm wondering, um, are you okay going with a few more questions or, because we can always go into rebuttals early tonight if we need to. I mean, if I want to. Who wants, so we already got two more questions on deck. Who else wants to ask another question? I, I would like a question. Yes, sir. All right, we'll go with, uh, we'll go with the rest of the questions. Here. And then we'll uh, go into rebuttal. Last question. Yes, sir. Okay, my question is this $15 minimum wage movement, is that good for the current society? No. The good wealth? Uh, is that good for the current welfare state? How does. How does well, that fit into your time? Yeah, because there would be more participants in those programs. But for. I mean, generally speaking, no. It, no, it's it's not it's not a good uh, it's not a good policy to implement the U.S. because more people would be replaced by people are being replaced by automation. Already. When you go to CVS, you see a lot of self checkouts because because they can because CVS can afford you know paying someone for something low. So having so increasing the the minimum wage to fifteen dollars will also increase the market value. So it will affect the low-skilled worker. The low-skilled worker will probably never get a job. On top of that, if the, if the minimum wage becomes $15 an hour, it will mean that someone to get an entry-level job may have to get a master's degree because everything increases at the same time. It's not such a bad thing, getting more education. I mean, I mean getting right. more education is always good, but just to get an entry-level job, that's... Uh, but people would pay, you have to take loans again and pay debts, school debts. I will go with Andy and then this, uh, this uh, lady right over here. Okay, Andy. Hey. Uh, the question I have, louder, uh, Andy. Have you seen any of the studies that show that you could live, you could live on a minimum wage job in 1968, right? Yeah. Well, if, if the minimum wage had kept pace, with inflation and everything else in today's cost. The minimum wage today would be 22 dollars an hour. So the fight for 15 is two thirds of a minimum wage. $12 is, is not even a minimum wage, it's $13. In most cities, you can't rent an apartment anywhere you give me $15 an hour without working two jobs. Do you have any thoughts on how people, middle class people, are well, just average workers, could go back to running, uh, you know, supporting your family on what you say is, you know, $15 an hour so, or, or less. Uh, how, how can people live 
without some kind of auxiliary assistance if the if the billionaire employers don't want to pay. So the, the the purpose of the minimum wage first is not for it's not for people to make a living of it. First of all, to just help them put them back on their feet. My question is, if you get rid of the minimum wage, how is that whole forty percent of the lower population? How are they going to survive without going into homeless shelters? I mean, if there is no minimum wage, they, they can actually be employed because yeah, people are looking for labor. They can be employed in a homeless shelter. That's right, what that's, talking about. Yeah, but people are looking for labor. They will get paid. People are looking for labor. Now, like, the, the people are being replaced by automation because the minimum wage keeps in, in, in increasing. Okay. Uh, Madam, you had a... You, you no, I did, I did oh, not. Oh, you did not? No. All right, Dave, and then we'll do George. Okay. Uh, in, uh, you were saying that... Uh, the U.S. is having a lot of problems, but uh, there's one. There's, they've done a lot of surveys on uh, uh, the satisfaction of citizens of countries, and consistently, the Scandinavian countries are ranked very high, according to their own citizens, of basically happiness, and they're taxed fairly highly and have fairly extensive uh, social support networks. So. Um, how do you hope to uh, set up a, a system that's, contra that's contrary to that and yet have results where the citizens are happy? Johann Norberg. So happiness is in the eyes of the beholder. So basically... Well, people are doing surveys. Yeah, but they're it's asking the everybody polls. the same question. No, I mean, but it's the same with polls. They're not definite. It's, it's at a moment. At a precise moment, because Scandinavian, first of all, Scandinavian countries do not have the problem, the problems we we do, because it's a homogeneous culture. So yeah. it's a homogeneous culture. So people, so the culture there is basically a standardized culture. Here we have different communities that have different beliefs. So to address the social, the socio economic issues, it's harder in the U.S. compared to Scandinavian to, compared to Scandinavian countries, and the population is like at most That's 10 crazy. million. Here we're more than 300 million. It's hard. Well, uh, uh, so, 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 so. socialism has failed around the world, except for the Scandinavian countries. Why do the Democrats want to push this uh, socialism, this uh, Green New Deal, and all this stuff? So. Scandinavian countries don't have socialism in the first place. It's true they have a lot of government intervention regulation, but they do not have socialism per se. And the reason why socialism is doomed to fail is because uh, central planners do not have the information that they need to enhance the economy, which means price, production, and capital. This, these are information you, found, you find in the market, not by central planners. Central planners, they just decide about, um, they, they make decisions about right. stuff that they don't know. And that is why they fail. That's why it failed in the Soviet Union. That's why it failed in Cuba. It's failing in Venezuela. And it's failing everywhere it's been tried. In, in Scandinavian countries, they have social democracy. The private um, citizens are still playing a big role in the economy. We'll do Robert, and this will be the last question. Why? Why? We're gonna take. What happened to Mike? Well, I, I got this from. I got this. I got the cutoff. No, so. no. Maybe he got a lot of time. I want to get my question. Let's go with. Okay, just just keep going. Keep going. All right, we'll go Robert, Dave, Travis. It'll be real short. I I don't know. This is my first time, so. All right. All right. Let's go with the questions. All right. So my my question. Uh, as far as like the welfare state, either uh, ending it or whatever opinions uh, are going around, going, going around this room, uh, what I don't see is uh, there's mainstream media, uh, to, uh, a lot of politicians um, promoting these um, you know, uh, free programs or, or whatever. Um, I don't see any of them except for the people who are talking about getting rid of the welfare state. I don't see anybody promoting personal responsibility and, and even hard work. 
Um, I don't really see that except for politicians like Dan Crenshaw, Thomas Massey, Peter Randall Hall, uh, from Melissa a lot. But I never saw anything from Obama or But those, Obama those, those politicians you mentioned, like Rand Paul, that's why they don't get elected. Exactly. Because they tell the truth. Yeah, because, uh, you know, to be honest, like, my parents were on welfare for most of their life. And somewhere along the line, they, you know, they split with two different points of view. My mother thought, I got to bust my ass. I got to work three jobs at one point. And I remember she was a teacher at Truman College. She was a manager at Swedish Covenant. Um, and she was a full-time mother as well. And my dad was totally gone. You know, he was, he was on welfare. And every time I heard him get a job, he always quit. He always had something to complain about. They're not, they're not giving me this. They're not giving me this. Because they're free. Yeah. It's just you, you don't hear people saying, I might have to stay up till 2 o'clock in the morning and sleep until, 8, uh, st uh, sleep until 8 o'clock in the morning and go back to work and hit it hard for a good three to five years until I get myself out of this hole. Which, you know, right now I'm living check to check. I'm also trying to start a business as well. Uh, from, you know, I got my 9 to 5, 5 to 9, I got my side business. What's the question? The question. The question. What, where, where do you think the government's role is to promote self so what the government should do is to, first of all, de decrease its size. So basically, uh, get rid of some programs. That's how people will actually feel more productive and more responsible about their lives. Because so long as those programs will exist, they, they, there will be no need for them to wake up in the morning and be productive. Because they, they have that free money coming to their company. <laughs> All right, what well, Dave Travis and uh, Adam Balling. Okay, David. Okay, uh, in 1913, the IRS was established, but income tax was not put into practice until 1921. I do not know, I, I do know that the uh, Federal Reserve was established in 1913 as well, but I don't know when that was put into practice. But I suspect it was some few years. So the people that were involved in creating the IRS, the income tax, and the Federal Reserve, I think it would be very telling to look up who the people were that were involved in doing that, what their names were, and if possible, what their political leanings were. Inasmuch as, much as the, the, um, Rock, I've, I've heard it said that the Rockefellers have supported socialism almost from the very beginning. Don't you, my question is, don't you think that would be very telling if that was looked into? <laughs> yes, it would be, right? Yeah. It would be telling, right? Yeah, no. <laughs> Stand up, please. Uh, Stand up. Uh, yes, please, sir. Thanks, Adam. I got a quick double barreled question. I want to talk if autobiographically, for the benefit of the room, you could describe some of the lower skilled jobs that you first took when you immigrated to the United States from Cote d'Ivoire and how many years you worked at each of them. And then uh, I know we got into the lava earlier, but the hot topic of you know further comments on the West European welfare states, their mix of market and social democracy, the percentages thereof, the tax percentages thereof, and their chances for success or not, or, or, or not if you could do those two. So, um, <coughs> So I got my first job on campus. I was working as a student assistant at the post office. I was paid seven seven twenty five an hour. It was my very first job. And then when I graduated with my political degree, couldn't find a job on Capitol Hill or anything. So I went to that uh, French restaurant called Le Pen Quotidien, and I applied for a job as a line cook there. So I worked there for over two years. So I worked as a line cook, as a cashier, and as a dishwasher. I was studying, sometimes uh, I was starting work at 5.30, finishing up at 3, or I could start at, uh, at 3 and finishing at 11. 
So I, I, do, I did that for uh, two years, and then I worked at another restaurant as a dishwasher again for another year and a half. So yeah, these are jobs that, these are low skip jobs, but we need, you know, we need a paycheck. We need to spend money on relevant things. So I didn't mind doing it, because to me it's experience that it's worth telling your kids at some point to tell them that money doesn't grow in the tree, you gotta work for it, or yeah. you're All not right. gonna move right. forward in life. Okay, I, anybody else? Yeah, we wonder if you gotta have time. I, I mean, when, when it comes to, um, so to the mixed economy in Western Europe, so I'm very, I'm personally skeptical of mixed economy. And the reason why is because government is <laughs> run by flooded individuals like all of us. So government running programs, eventually it will lead to a central planning. That is what I, that, that is why I personally do not like mixed economies. Because for now it's working fine, but does it mean that it will remain like that for the next 40 years? Probably not. Okay. And people we'll are getting one more, more inclined to, um, to central planning. One more question with Steve Duttner, and then we'll go to rebuttals. Isn't that true that these Scandinavian countries like Denmark and some of the other ones aren't truly really socialist, they just have a bloated welfare program, yet they're really free market capitalist countries that are now re-looking this bloated, cap uh, the bloated welfare state? Um, I just saw a video with, I believe it was the president of Denmark, who said that their their system right now, and he came out because a lot of socialists are claiming. Yeah, I, I know yeah. the video you're talking so about. So is it yes. not truly really, really a welfare no, it's, problem? It's not really a socialist country. No, it's not a socialist country because socialism is, the, is government <laughs> controlling the means of production. Yeah, in Scandinavia, that's not no, the case. They not. Sure, they do have a big welfare state, yeah, yeah. but yeah. it's... It, they don't control the means of production of every single industry. All right, let's hear it for Germano. And let's give a hand. Let's, uh, who wants to give a rebuttal tonight? Raise your hand. Thank you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Uh, we got time for about five minutes apiece. <laughs> All right. And the moderator. Can... Oh, thanks. Yeah. All right. Andy, you got the time? I'll take I got the time. All right. Let's, uh, five minutes apiece. I will ask again, everybody, please be coherent and concise and make your point. Don't just bloviate for five minutes. Bring us to a point, please. Well, let's put it this way. One full at a time. To allow the government to negotiate drug prices. 78% of Americans want students to receive the same low interest rates as big banks, which is 100%. 77% of Americans want universal free pre-kindergarten education. 75% of Americans want fair trade, which protects workers, the environment, jobs, instead of free trade. 74% of Americans want to end corporate tax loopholes, which allow corporations to reduce jobs in the U.S. 73% to end gerrymandering in the U.S. 71% of Americans want Medicare for all in the U.S. 71% of Americans want full disclosure of corporate spending on politics and lobbying in the U.S. 71% of Americans support $400 billion a year in infrastructure project. 71% of Americans support debt-free policy at all public universities. 70% of Americans want expanding Social Security benefits. 70% of Americans want a full employment act so the government could be the employer of last resort. Because the government is we the people, not some other entity. 70% of Americans want to free train coal miners and oil workers for clean energy jobs. 70% of Americans want to end tax deductions for Wall Street criminal fines. 66% of Americans want to have transparency in trade negotiations. 64% of Americans want workers at jobs where they receive tips receiving a full minimum wage. 63% of Americans want to end financial requirements for students at community colleges. 66% of Americans want to require all corporate 
It's political spending to be approved by shareholders. 59% of Americans want to tax the rich at at least 50%. It was at 74% in the 80s before Ronald, I'm going to go to Philadelphia, Mississippi and talk about states' rights and the first stop on my campaign stop, which all the libertarians know full well is straight up racism. So it's very convenient to have someone who's an African American come and speak in behalf of the libertarian standpoint. This Stalinist in it, Jonathan. Be cool. We voted libertarian. Don't worry, I saved my best for last for this one. Fifty-nine percent of Americans want a minimum guaranteed income. Fifty-eight percent of Americans want to break up the big banks. Fifty-four percent of Americans want to tax the rich. Fifty percent want to have a financial transactional tax. And there's one American here tonight whose mother was a retired nurse, Linda Barton. If you know, Clara Barton founded the American Red Cross and the American Revolution. So no CEO came up with that idea. They had to die with their blood in the revolution to save those young soldiers when they were wounded in a war to give us the freedoms that you won't find on any market value scoreboard. You'll find it in the fact that we are the best chance to have socialism on planet Earth. That's my rebuttal. Yeah. First of all, the depressions are inherent in capitalism. Every ten, eight to ten years, you have depressions. At one time, they didn't call them depressions, they called them panics. And people were so scared, they were in a panic because they couldn't get jobs, they didn't have nothing to eat, and they were desperate. And that's what happens under capitalism. We have what you call overproduction and underconsumption. What that actually means is people produce a certain amount of goods, and the goods that are sold bring in a profit. But the workers do not get much of the profit. They might get 20% at the most at this time, maybe 10%. So that's why you have billionaires that are real rich. You have three people in the United States that have half the wealth of the country. You have Jeff Bezos, you have Warren Buffett, and Bill Gates that own half of the wealth of the United States. It's become top heavy with profit. And, that's, and, and the, the reason why they have so much profit and so many people are so poor because of exploitation that is built into capitalism. Capitalism is a form of slavery. It's not outright slavery, it's not feudalism, but it's a form of slavery and that's why the capitalists get so rich. So what happens is right now the economy is starting to go down. The statistics just came out and only 75,000 people got jobs. It has to be at least over 130,000 in order to keep up with the population. Another thing, they don't count people who stop looking for work. That's about over 40 uh, percent. Right now, there are people that are just coming into the market and they're not counted either. So one of the progressive economists said the unemployment level is probably about 38 percent in the United States. But it's well hidden. They never talk about it. If you put on the news, the television stations, the radio, the newspapers, you don't hear about it. It's only people on the left that are talking about it. So another thing is, this is somebody said, um, socialism has failed. If socialism has failed, What's happening in China is not a miracle. It's socialism. It's, it's the Communist Party that is running the country, and they're outpacing us. We had a speaker last week, and he was talking about it. They're more modern than we are. They don't have no downturns in the economy. It's about 6 or 6.5% uh, employment every year. The people there get a 10% increase in wages every year, so socialism has not failed. It failed in, in, in Russia because they devoted so much money to armaments. 
they had to keep up with the United States and didn't have enough to give to the people there. So it failed. But the Chinese learned the lesson, and they learned the lesson that you have to not only build missiles in order to defend themselves, but if you want to save the economy, you got to give, give people economic benefits, and like uh, Medicare and stuff, stuff of that uh, nature. So it's not failed at all. Hi, what is me here tonight? It wasn't something I've been looking at for the last two days. It has nothing to do with money. Where we're at is biodiversity, and it's going downhill. So what do we do about it? How many of you have heard of E.O. Wilson? Do you know who he is? E.O. Wilson. Yeah. He's called the Ant Man. He studied ants. His birthday was yesterday night. So kid said you got a year on him. Okay. Anyway, uh, so what what is this half year thing? This half year thing. What he proposes to do is this. To save our biosphere. It's not, this is not, it's not money. It's the biosphere. We're all part we're part of it. He proposes to have half the earth uh, will be given back to nature. Whatever we have to do. Well the capitalists they don't like that because they can't make any money. They can't make any money, but there's not gonna be anyone left. There's not gonna be anyone left. He studied ants for many years. What do you know about ants? Anyone know anything about ants? Ants, ants are the most successful species we pay you on Earth. There are ants in all continents except Antarctica and Greenland. They're all over the place. Now you don't like them, you don't like them in your kitchen, but they have a very good system. It works out pretty good for them. They're organized. So this ants are socialistic. Oops. I don't know I if you're aware of this, but there are, in terms of mass, ants, yeah, there's more mass of ants than there are all the rest of insects combined. So the ants have made it. So I recommend we pay attention to the ants. But forget the money. Pay attention to the ants. All right. All right. Next. If you need to, take care of your kitchen. All right. Who's next? Okay. You forgot the ump. Okay, nobody's going to go. So I'll take the funny for a second. So uh, I just have to make a rebuttal about a comment that was made. Um, uh, by the speaker who said that I uh, just can't get elected if you tell the truth. You just can't. So that means conversely, you have a better chance of getting elected the more you tell lies. So can anybody think of an example of somebody who's a really successful politician in telling lies? <laughs> I'm not going to say any words. But I, I, I guess I'll end that little uh, squib by uh, quoting our fearless president and uh, when he says, uh, when he said, I am a very stable genius. So I don't think there's anything left to, to say about our president. Um, uh, I think that um, that really broke me up when he said that. <laughs> so uh, uh, regarding uh, the whole welfare thing, um, I, I, I think through, in, it, through in, I think uh, Jonathan really hit the nail on the head when he noted that there wasn't a lot of talk about corporate welfare. And uh, the, the implication that I got from that is that uh, there really isn't a lot of corporate welfare or it's not something that needs to be dealt with. The, the focus needs to be on um, social welfare. And, uh, you know, Reagan came up with a great slogan to deal with corporate welfare. It, it, he, he called it tri trickle-down economics. 
right? Focus because you you you, you give you, you support the businesses as much as they can, and eventually that money filters down to the people, to citizens, and uh, they never talk about tinkle down economics because it's basically people are just getting pissed on. Uh, the, the, you look at what's happening now, the economy is going bust. It's going bust, but where are all the profits going? The profits aren't going to people. They're going to the wealthiest Americans. It's really just shameful. So, um, and regarding uh, moving towards uh, less uh, welfare, I have a personal story to tell. I do genealogy, and my great, great, great grandfather was 33 years old when he died in central Pennsylvania. And he um, uh, basically left a wife and four kids to fend for, uh, for themselves. And uh, in, the, in my research, I found that basically what, what did they do? There's no social network. So what did the system do? They, uh, they found foster parents for the two daughters. And uh, I'm not, not sure how the two sons fared, but the two daughters were actually placed in foster homes. Now, what did that mean back then, when there's no system? Basically, turn them into children who were indentured servants. Can you imagine a horrible thing like that? The family, their motive, they're, they're thinking, well, i got to put food in their mouth, so what am I going to do? I'm going to make them work. It's just a terrible, terrible thing. I mean, it, it, social... Everybody talks about the horrible side of the, the argument that they don't agree with, and there has to be some medium. You just can't, they have to have some kind of social safety net for people, or you're going to experience the French Revolution all over again. All right. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to say about this um, Federal Reserve, uh, some years ago, under the Obama administration, the Federal Reserve decided to have QE1, QE2, and QE3. They turned up three trillion dollars, and what happened? I think it was for the for the banking uh, to bail out the banks. They never said why they did this, and could it cause massive inflation? I think it can, and uh, three trillion dollars. And uh, the other thing. And that was caused by the Democrats when they said you have to give mortgages to people who are unqualified. And they gave mortgages, and then the, the, the mortgages uh, for, for, forfeited, and then it, it caused, the, caused the, the crisis of 2008. Anyway, I want to talk about this great man, Trump. I know you all don't believe that, but he made a great uh, agreement yesterday, I believe it was, with Mexico. Oh, yeah. We're getting 100,000 uh, illegals coming across the border every month. And he uh, agreed with Mexico to stop them at the Guatemalan border, at the southern border of Mexico. It was in the paper today, even. And uh, that, that is a great uh, achievement. Anyway, uh, these illegals, once they get in here, they all got lawyers and advocates. They, they, they got more rights than us. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, Eventually, it'll be like affirmative action and, and uh, they will discriminate against Americans. And that's what I'm concerned about. All right. All right. Good evening. I'm David Travis. Hi, David. Hi, David. Hi, David. Yeah. Uh, our subject tonight was welfare, is welfare. I'd like to say that the ones that benefit the most from welfare are not the recipients. Uh, Robert Ringer points out in his book, Restoring the American Dream, that uh, something like 60% of the money appropriated goes for the cost of administration of welfare. So. If you look at it today, I see a lot of people that are on welfare, and uh, the man goes out and with a uh, squeegee and washes windows and makes enough money so that he and his family, along with the welfare, they get by. Uh, other men go out and do house painting, 
uh, others are auto mechanics, and they all do it under the table for cash so that uh, they don't have to be bothered by the income tax and all of that sort of thing, and they get by. Now, if welfare were shut off tomorrow, if they made an announcement and said there will be no more welfare, these people would all still be able to get by because they have that to fall back on. Even certain women doing babysitting and so forth. But the ones that would be hard pressed would be those who work in the administration of welfare. They would have to go out and try to sign up to get on welfare because all the caseworkers would be out of the job. All the, the, the uh, welfare inspectors and welfare oh, this and welfare that. So uh, if you really look at the thing, welfare <laughs> is on welfare. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Uh, during announcements, I forgot to mention, Germinal will be back uh, on August uh, 17th. He's, he's going to give a talk uh, called uh, Gold Standard versus Fiat Money. So, Germinal will be back. So, uh, yes. Uh, let's also not forget that June is Pride Month, and because of... Uh, uh, some transgender folks with bricks throwing it at cops. We uh, have now uh, brought uh, equality rights to uh, our LGBT friends. So let's keep that in mind. Also, the Libertarian Party's uh, first presidential nominee, John Hospers, first homosexual that we know that you know was uh, nominated by a political party. So openly, not like James Buchanan. I <laughs> uh, also want to uh, uh, acknowledge the passing of David Berglund, uh, who was the 84 LP presidential nominee. May he rest in peace. Um, with Germinal's talk, I agree with a lot of the things he said. You know, we need to end the Fed, we need to institute some sort of free banking. I agree that if we're going to have a welfare state, uh, we should uh, have the Feds be out of it and let the states. Uh, provide for their own welfare benefits. Uh, this makes it more accountable to the people and uh, you can actually then begin to kind of manage it on manage welfare system on the scale that Scandinavian countries do. Um, and then you know with 50 countries that's you know like you know the uh, 50 experiments of democracy sort of thing. So we can see what works with welfare uh, policies and not based on how states implement them. Um, so localize, localize, localize. I agree with Jonathan, there should have been more discussion on corporate welfare. I don't think Germinal's mission was to imply that uh, it's not an issue. Um, I just think he specifically meant within the context of social welfare. Uh, and, and libertarians do need to attack corporate welfare one full at a time, please. Cor uh, libertarians do need to attack corporate welfare as harshly and vigorously as uh, any sort of, you know, redistribution. So uh, I don't think Germinal was trying to imply, you know, that he was condoning that behavior. I just don't think he thought it was within the scope of his talk. Um, the reason why Germinal is speaking tonight is because I told him about the college complexes and uh, it sounded interesting to him and he reached out to Charlie on his own. He picked the topic on his, on his own and because he's an officer in our LP chapter, of course we're going to come out and support him. So there's no, we're not propping him up, we're not, you know, we're not trying to imply anything uh, nefarious. This is all germinal and this is all him. And this it's, restaurant is germinal funded. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that was kind of out of bounds. Ronald Reagan is not a libertarian, even if he says he was. So, uh, that's all I got. Thank you. All right. I'm going next. Good job. Good job. We got two of What's up, Tom? Uh, you see, it's like, um, can you guys hear me well enough now? Sure. All right. Why don't you just say that I don't?
The thing is, yeah. with me, I'm a capitalist because I know what works. There's never been a more greater wealth creation engine Thank you. and to see a free market running and a free enterprise system. Thank you. The problem with the United States and some of these other countries right now is the rise of monopolistic corporations and the power they have to uh, affect wealth. You know, there was something that uh, Teddy Roosevelt did called the antitrust laws that helped break up a lot of these monopolies. There was trusts back in the, 18, in, the, in the early 1910s. We had a similar situation back then where capitalism was giving away from the rich and the poor and the labor were not getting the deal that capitalism was providing. And a lot of that was because of special favors to the corporations and to business. You know, if, for example, if you go to a small town and say Walmart wants to come in, the first thing they're going to ask you is that uh, I want to be a, a, we're going to provide this many jobs, so we'd like this from you, basically an abatement of property tax, basically we'd like to get some infrastructure put in, and uh, we'd like a little help with the buildings because we're going to be providing this much jobs and this much economic activity to the community. And in effect, what they're doing is giving away the store to a company like Walmart who might come into that small community. After all the abatements are done, after everything else, they close up shop and leave. That's the one type of welfare that I really think stinks. You know, we get a lot of special favors to uh, government, uh, government contracts to a lot of corporations who basically s seek the government trough for you know, medical and all this other stuff, you know, we find that there's a lot of corruption in, in that kind of system. Yes, I'm for, um, yes, I'm for uh, a social safety net because when people talk about all the welfare cheats, it's certainly a lot less than a lot of the corruption that you get when you have special favors to some of these larger corporations. I can tell you an industry that does work well under capitalism, and that is the consumer electronics industry. There's a lot of competition, there's a lot of product innovation, and there is a lot of cooperation amongst the companies for promoting standardization of components so that those things can be talking to each other. What do I like? I would like more capitalism. Because the thing is, it also doesn't work in poorer countries because the poor can't get title to their land or their businesses or their needs of production. And once you have ownership and a chance to grow and making facilities that you can lend those assets against, you will find that uh, that's how countries get wealthy. People go to work, entrepreneurs start businesses, and businesses need, businesses have to serve customers. <coughs> and one thing that's nice about capitalism is that when you go to work, you're actually doing something productive. <laughs> the CEO. Yeah. Charlie, you know, as much as I, as much as I see you with your stupid views on cap on, on socialism, yes, I admit there's a lot of fault with some of the capitalistic practices right now. But you know, the thing is, we've reformed in the past. It's still the fastest way to create wealth. And you know, even our government democracy is inefficient. But like anything else. It's better than all the rest. And I'll just leave it at that. It's always better than all the rest because the evidence is there. And Sid, I'm sorry, but I disagree with you wholeheartedly. <coughs> China may be prospering, but they're doing it because they're letting capitalism in. They're copying us what we were doing in the 40s and the 50s with industrialization. And that's why they're succeeding not despite 
the Communist Party. Thank you. All right, let's give our, uh, our speaker kind of hand here. We, uh, we take our best uh, and uh, handled himself well, and we look forward to seeing you again uh, in the future. Uh, the thing about uh, the thing about China, we had the thing about China last week. You have to realize very quickly, it took Great Britain a hundred years to industrialize. It took the United States 50. Um, it took Japan 25 years, and China's rapid growth is simply an accelerated history of, of industrialization. So I'd be cautious as putting too much into that. And I'll be eclectic as usual here. Uh, there's very few labor laws. I actually teach a course on this, but possibly the finest law passed by the United States government in the history of this country has been the Fair Labor Standards Act, which eliminated such activities as child labor, uh, established the eight-hour day, saw to it that individuals uh, worked a 40-hour week uh, instead of 100 hours, and so forth and worse. Uh, the only problem with it, the act is that there are increased evidence of wage theft. There's been books written about that one among, and studies done right here in this city. The thing about the overall economy in general, uh, capitalism fails uh, historically uh, on the average about once every five years in this nation. And it fails of in and of itself without any assistance by the government for free regulatory periods in which it failed of significant uh, things. Uh, to attribute any of these to the government of the United States is fallacious and not supported by any of the historical evidence that I'm aware of. Um, the fact of the matter is, getting to our talk tonight, anybody that knows this, that the disparity between the rich and the poor in this nation is the worst it has ever been. The 1% and the 99% are so disparate as, as to be unbelievable. It's not, and we have not achieved this in the history of this nation. And yet tonight we have a speaker that comes here and says, looks at the lower portion of the 99% and says we should make them even lower, offers no solution. As a matter of fact, I don't understand this. When you advance a theory, you've got to avoid what I call like an endless loop or a conundrum. Now he says that the, the people that are making minimum wage should not ask for more money, even though they're not earning enough to live on. It's not a living wage. But they should not ask for more money because that would hurt the economy. So they should be asking for less money. And that would hurt the economy. I don't understand this. Who's going to, how do you benefit yourself by asking for less money? Yeah. But ultimately, it's going to, oh, I, I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> I'm not earning enough now to sustain myself, but I'm supposed to ask for less. <laughs> and this will be beneficial somehow in the wider perspective, I guess, by having more people, the less, the less they earn, the better things will be. So let's go, hey, thank you very much. I want to do a talk on the straw mans of Charles Haydock, the history of, the, of all the straw mans. Say what you want. The less they are, the better it is. Yeah, we start the whole month, I'm going to do it. All right. Um, I'll you on this morning. <laughs> One foot at a time. All right. Um, my name is uh, Stephen Lewis. Uh, this is the first time I'm here. He's kind of So one thing I wish to touch on tonight um, is part of the welfare state is considering what a decent chunk of what I would consider our welfare spending goes to which would be health care. Um, 
Medicare is the third largest pro federal government program. It was second only recently. It was passed by the military. Of course, Social Security is the most expensive. Um, I believe the fourth most expensive government program is Medicaid. And on top of that, we also have Obamacare, which a lot is about $40 billion last time I checked in additional uh, health care spending. Um, but I bring this up because the biggest perception as someone who works in healthcare that I encounter when I talk about this topic with other people is that the United States is some free market healthcare country and all the others are completely socialist. 100% of all healthcare expenses are covered by the government in other Western European nations. This is simply false. At best, I would say America is a mixed healthcare market with a healthy amount, with a large amount of government spending in addition to a large amount of private spending. In itself has its own pluses and minuses. I could say some of the pluses of government spending on healthcare is obviously people that receive it don't necessarily have to pay the full costs of what it takes to deliver that healthcare because of taxes paid by other people. One of the minuses is what I encounter in my work. Um, I deal with a lot of specialty medications, uh, medications that are still under patent by the drug companies that made them because the patent laws in this country allow a drug company to have a patent for about five, 10 years or so, which is a long time. And because of that, they're allowed to essentially monopolize on the new medication they've just created. Now yeah. that now that would sound now that is obviously a negative. One of the issues, though, is that in a lot of the single payer or so countries that people associate with in Western Europe, not many medications, new medications, are brought to the market in the first place. In fact, about 50% of the existing drugs in the world are first invented in the United States. To put things to put things simply. It sort of takes a mix of both, is what I have learned from my experience in healthcare. It takes some, it does take some social spending from government to help out the most disadvantaged people. But the idea that you can completely nationalize it and have the government run everything, well, very quickly, you'll run out, very quickly, you'll stop innovating. And that's what the issue will be. That's the reason why a lot of the drugs that are first created in America come overseas years after they've been introduced, introduced into the American market, in which then those governments buy them at essentially in bulk. And thus, they essentially can cheat and say that they're paying, the people in those countries are paying less for prescription drugs. The reality is, it, it's somewhat true but they're not getting the prescription drugs that they need in the same speed that Americans are getting them at. Um, yeah, that's basically what I have to say. All right, there we go. Stand up, boy, Steve. Come on, next one. We got more, right? All right, I'm a veteran in both senses. There he is. Still one. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman El Sherrod Graff, for an interesting and contentious talk where even I was ready to argue with some of the points. I thought that the unemployment statistics you quoted for African Americans at 70 something percent were unbelievably high, unless that's like by locality or certain age ranges. Similarly, Mr. Cohen, your 38% unemployment rate is the kind of number Donald Trump throws around at his rallies in the red states. Um, now, I've got a lot to go through. In terms of uh, blaming the causes of depressions, I would cite the authority of John Kenneth Galbraith, a Keynesian and admirer of democratic socialism. This is available for those who don't want to read in his documentary, The Age of Uncertainty, which you can watch most of on YouTube, except they took the sound off the final episode because of music rights, ha -ha. that people want loose money, but the things that hard money buys, or maybe the other way around, they want their money to have value, but then they want the boom that they can create with easy credit. And he traced this throughout the 19th century, all the way up to Great Depression, and the episode, The Rise and Fall of Money, in his polite, 
measured Canadian American way that uh, you cannot hang on us as libertarian propaganda. Incidentally, it was a TV producer in Erie, Pennsylvania, who talked to Milton Friedman and said, my God, if John Kenneth Galbraith gets his own documentary, do we get ours? And that brought us free to choose in 1980. Uh, I want to say that if Mr. Cohen and others think that capitalism is slavery, we know that the People's Republic of China, as Charlie has pointed out many a time himself from the left, is full of sweatshop slavery even today. And what's further during Mao's time, that was Here, just copy. state slavery. And that's what the Soviet system was, that's what most of the Cuban system and Cambodian system under the Khmer Rouge and its successors has been. Um, we idealize the EU, but if we look at the recent EU parliamentary elections, it's not just Brexit. The only countries where social democratic parties, I realize it's a plurality rather than majority, won, but the only country where social democratic parties won the plurality or majority were Spain and Portugal, countries that were run by military dictatorships or fascist regimes a few years before I was born <coughs> in the 1970s. Yes, I gave away my age. The alt-right did suffer some setbacks in Denmark, Dave, I'm happy to report, because they had an alt-right party that was on the rise, but they're still growing in Sweden. Norway does not participate because they're not really a member of the EU, uh, nor does Iceland, because they're way out in the mid-Atlantic. Um, I scribbled these down, I apologize. I agree that L Lord Acton, whose famous quip was that power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely, talked about the natural state of human affairs being both despotism and poverty. And it's only during these brief flashes that we actually have prosperity and or freedom. Uh, it's easy for it to go away. And if these EU elections where neo-fascist parties are on the rise in France or Italy, uh, or even in fourth place in Germany, that makes me nervous. And I'm German-American. Um, no one needs that, and it can all go away easily. It's not something we can idealize, and Brexit is just the beginning, unfortunately. And I don't say that with enthusiasm. I'd rather have us all trading together and getting along. Uh, there's a political scientist named James Scott. I don't have his book with me, but he has done work on peasant rebellions. He's done work on mismanagement by government policies. I believe he's at Yale. Um, and he's got one on the art of not being governed about people in the Himalayas who avoided the rice cultivating super states of Southeast Asia and decided, you know what? I'd rather live in the hills and grow root vegetables and not be dominated by uh, the mandarins or the, the jamindars or the other lords of the region. I'm sorry Trumpy George is gone. I don't know his last name. Um, if Mexico, he thinks this is some hot deal between Trump and uh, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, they can't stop the cartels because their drug war is a bigger failure than our own or it's just an extension of it in an you know, undemocratic or failing democracy, rather. And how does he expect them to be able to control the border any better than ICE does with its resources? Because, again, it's a false premise, in my opinion. Uh, Germinal, we know plenty of low-wage uh, immigration, including undocumented or quote-unquote illegal immigration, that works its rear end off, you know, doing construction, doing all kinds of low-skill work. So I thought that was a bit of a red herring. Um, where else am I? In Germany, where um, most college tuition is subsidized or near fully subsidized, Dahrendorf's book talked about how back then, in about 1959 or 60, only 10% of all university students were recruited from the working class, and among agrarian children, only about one out of three completed their secondary education. More recently, uh, in German la English language German news source as well, the numbers are up somewhat from then, but this is with about 1,000 euros per student and expenses out of pocket. Three quarters, over three quarters of German university students, with their ride more or less fully paid by the German taxpayer, are upper middle class, had parents who went to university. Fewer than one in four are actually from the working class or had parents who didn't go. Okay. And last but not least, Karl Marx was lamenting how sectarian American socialism was back during his own lifetime, as did Engels, and is cited for one of the reasons of the failure of the movement to grow here. Whereas Samuel Gompers was a, rather have the labor negotiating on its own rather than getting the laws. And Charlie, if you think there ain't enough laws, I hope you know Ms. Scotch Paul's book. She's a democratic socialist. And she's sharp as a tack. Anyway, I know I'm a bit shouty. I got mad at Jonathan earlier because I know I've heard Stalinist genocide defended here by a certain R.S. Yanibus, who I think is absent. 
Uh, so, you know, that got me a little hot under the collar, you know, as if we were somehow, when I was three years old, campaigning for Reagan in Philadelphia, Mississippi. But if that was out of line, I apologize, Jonathan, and rest of the forum. All Thank right, you. All right, let's play nice. It's good to hear Carl Marx at the college. <laughs> He's dead wrong, Charlie. <laughs> well, for those of you who don't know me or that you're new, my name is Andy Anderson, and uh, my brother and I run an information service. It's free to the public. We help people learn stuff. We basically summarize books. We call it a database translation. So if you don't have time to read 10 or 20 books a week or in a month on one subject, We've read those books and digested them over a couple of years, and we publish single-page summaries that give you the main basic facts. Uh, one of the main books we work with, where's, where's my those books? I had a book here, maybe it's floating around. Uh, there's a book called Merchants of Doubt that describes how university professors are paid to produce reports that are 180 degrees out of phase from reality. And then, it's called the tobacco strategy. Uh, can I have a show of hands here briefly? Who thinks here, who really believes that you can improve your health by smoking four packs a day? <laughs> yeah. that, that's that's a little so humor there, right? Now, why don't we have a disagreement on that subject? Forty years ago, they were advertising on television, put zest in your life. They gave free cigarettes to people in the, in the military. But we're on the same page because the answer is no. The scientific evidence has been published. There's been all kinds of books published talking about the gap, the wealth gap in America between the rich and the poor. We have the widest gap between poor and rich. Our speaker tonight said that more and more people, the middle class is shrinking because people are moving out of the middle class up into the higher classes. That is 100% false. That's as far out of touch as observable reality you can be. It's like looking out there and saying it's a snowstorm in June when it's clear. It's, a, it's uh, Censored News out of Sonoma State publishes a book this size every year called Project Censored News, the top 25 blacked out stories that would change America overnight if they were covered rather than suppressed by the media. The media runs a two-pronged process. They promote the myth on all channels 24-7 and they black out scientists that have published the actual reality. It's like Albert Einstein and 500 of his friends saying, hey, the earth isn't flat. Well, what are you going to do with a group like Albert and his friends? On economics, on uh, industrial, medical industrial complex, military industrial, there's groups like Albert and his friends that publish the forensic evidence from all different backgrounds. This isn't a, an opinion of one person like Rush Limbaugh or Sean Hannity. Upton Sinclair was famous for saying, it's hard to get a man to understand a fact when his salary depends on him not understanding it. I didn't get a chance to ask our speaker, what is your current job today? Who are you employed by? You, yeah, who, who, I work for myself. You, so you're self-employed. What, yeah. what do you do? You run a research center? Or no, no, like I, I'm a writer. You're a writer. Okay, thank you. I just, I was curious. The Koch brothers. <laughs> right now, self when you talk about welfare, the welfare system in America, you have to talk about, there's two kinds of welfare. There's welfare for poor people, and there's welfare for rich billionaires. And the welfare with shoveling money to billionaires for all kinds of different things is probably 10 or 20 times the size of the total amount of money being given to poor people and welfare down at the bottom. It's 700, 800 billion dollars a year to contractors that sell to the military. That's the largest welfare system on the planet. The pharmaceutical industry recently, did anybody see that piece of, uh, uh, the piece of video of one of our congressmen interviewing a drug representative? He was asked, why does this bottle of pills, 30 pills per month, why does this cost $8 in Australia, but it's $1,800 a month in America? And the man looked right into the camera and said, well, in Australia, they don't have patent protection. 
The yeah. message to the drug yeah. companies to people in America is, I'm sorry your son, little Johnny, is dying because you can't afford the medicine, but we need our billions. That crap isn't tolerated in any other modern country on this planet. You know, children should have a right to clean air, clean water, a livable environment, a decent place to live. A child born today shouldn't have be destined to live in a homeless shelter because the parents can't afford to, can't find a living wage job. Incidentally, all this idea about people not wanting to work hard, they, you overlook the fact that living wage jobs in factories, 60,000 factories were dismantled here and moved to China, Taiwan, Mexico. Living wage jobs for everybody are not in America anymore, period. So a lot of people would like to have a living wage job and be willing to work hard. There's not enough jobs to go around. That's why the unemployment statistics are grossly distorted because they're not counting people as unemployed that are working two jobs for a homeless shelter wage. A lot of people living in homeless shelters actually have two minimum wage jobs at seven bucks an hour. And that's enough for gas and oil and food and no money for rent outside of the homeless shelter. That's all over this country. And People that aren't in homeless shelters living in a couch in a basement of some friend, they don't have a place of their own. And this is, last thing I'll say is, study the Powell memo from 1973. Lewis Powell, who became a Supreme Court Justice, put out a memo to the Chamber of Commerce in 73 and said, you, you CEOs, the owners of companies, you have to form your own media. We have to start taking control of the narrative because middle class people are beginning to think they have a right to a decent job. The middle, the middle class is growing too much, they have too much wealth, and we have to start taking it back. And that's yeah. what we have in America today is, is a corporate, we have a, a whole cadre of corporate billionaire predators who couldn't operate companies in other countries, Sweden, Switzerland, so the Scandinavian countries. They put a cap, more or less, on wealth. Uh, they don't allow a CEO to make four, five, six hundred times what the average worker makes. A few years back, Japan got nervous when their CEOs were making 12 times as much as the average worker. So uh, we need to address address some things that are happening in uh, based on reality, not living in the bubble of what the media tells us. Thank you. Um, close us out, Andy. I think you're the last. You're living in a bubble. the last word. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Speaker gets the last word. Yeah. Do you want to address any of the comments? Last word. Okay. Last word. He gets the last word. Is any of that understandable? Oh, that's good. Um, well, thank you for, for the rebuttal. It was very interesting to learn new information. And I'm definitely looking forward to come back here. Uh, I would like to address one comment um, regarding the middle class shrinking. It is shrinking if there is a, a, uh, a study conducted by Pew Research Center, which is of course one of the most critical American sources in, in terms of policy studies that confirms that the middle class is shrinking either in the upper class or in the lower class. So I wanted to confirm that. So what I said was not a, um, a false statement. But I am definitely looking forward to come back uh, in, in August. It was a pleasure to be here and to, to present my subject to you and you guys get to ask questions and share your opinion with me. Thank you very much and I'll see you guys uh, next time. Okay, uh, that's it for tonight for the College of Complexes on June 8th. We will see you all next week, hopefully. We're adjourned.